Hello everyone. In today's video, we're going to talk about how to prepare a lab protocols article to submit to PLOS One. So I'll briefly talk in this section about the different sections of a lab protocol article, as well as how to write those sections that have unique requirements compared to other types of research articles that you may have written. And these include the abstract, introduction, materials and methods, expected results, and the supplemental files. So the first thing you want to do is use the template to get started. You want to download the template from the PLOS website, and that template lists all sections in order and notes the specific requirements for each of the individual sections. So that is your instruction guide to this article type, and it will help you to get started. For those of you who are watching this video as part of the Publish My Protocol Working Group course, we have downloaded the template for you and you can find it on Teams in the Files section of the general channel. There are a number of sections of the template that are very similar to normal research articles, and I've simply listed these here, but you can complete them as you would for any other article. Those sections include the title, metadata, which is authors and affiliations, the funding statement, competing interests, data availability with links to data and code, and I'll briefly discuss a little bit of information about this section later, associated content, and the minimum info there is a DOI for your protocol deposited on Protocols.io, ethics declarations and acknowledgement sections and author contributions. And authors are encouraged to use the credit taxonomy for this to specify what each author did, as well as references. So these sections are very similar to any other research article and you can simply fill them in in the template as you would for a standard article. There are five sections of the lab protocols article that have unique requirements, and we are going to discuss each of those sections in detail. Those are the abstract, the introduction, the materials and methods, the expected results, and the supporting information sections. The ex introduction and respected, expected results sections are the ones that take the most time, and so that's where we'll focus most of our discussion, but we'll focus on the easier sections first. So for the abstract, our goal is to help readers to determine whether the protocol is relevant for their research. So in this section, you want to concisely describe what the protocol does, the type of experiment or researcher that the protocol is designed for, the limitations of the protocol, and you want to briefly summarize the expected results and the formats of the output, and that summary should be one sentence. The materials and methods sections, in most of the lab protocols article, this section is one sentence and they are very specific about the text that they want you to use. And that text is simply the protocol described in this peer reviewed article is published on protocols.io with a link to the protocol and is included for printing as a supporting information file one within this article. There are some examples of published lab protocols articles that provide additional information and context in this section, but in most cases, it is simply this one section in the materials and methods section. For your first supplemental file, you need to make a PDF of your protocol downloaded from Protocols.io, and you can simply submit that downloaded protocol as the supplemental file S1. The supporting information, so as we just discussed, you are required to upload a PDF copy of your protocol saved from Protocols.io as the supporting information file S1. There are other optional supporting information files that you may choose to include. For example, you may include additional supporting information files that are relevant to the protocol and results. For example, calibration curves, proof of concept data, et cetera. And it's important to note here that sharing data in the supplement generally is not recommended, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later in the presentation. The introduction will take you a little bit more time to write. So according to the template, you want to describe the development and application of the protocol, how it compares to other protocols and any limitations, and you should use citations where they are appropriate. There are a number of common themes that the introductions of lab protocols articles tend to address. 
These include why the protocol is needed, what the protocol produces, what problems the authors encountered while developing the protocol and how they solved those problems, how the protocol compares to other protocols on this topic, and the known limitations of the protocol. So these are all things that you might want to think about addressing in the introduction of your protocol. If you are depositing or sharing an article with a new protocol, then you might want to spend more time in the introduction talking about why the protocol is needed. If your protocol presents an improvement over previous protocols in this area, then your introduction might focus more on how the protocol compares to other protocols and solutions to problems that arose during the protocol development. So in other words, explaining why your protocol is an advance and how you address some known problems with pre-existing protocols. The expected results section is a little bit more complicated. Uh, the published articles typically follow one of three different approaches, and which approach is best will depend on the specific type of protocol that you're depositing. I'll share the three approaches on the next slides, but it's important to note that each of these approaches assume that you haven't already published data collected using your protocol. If you have already published data collected using your protocol, then the instructions for authors note that you can cite that data and briefly discuss how this data show that the protocol works. At the time these slides were prepared, we were unable to find any examples of protocols that have used this approach. People tend to be publishing newer protocols as opposed to older protocols that have been used to generate data already. However, if you are publishing a protocol that you have already used to publish data, you should be aware that this is an option. So, the first approach is to describe what the protocol yields and the benefits of using it. And we've provided an example publication here that you can check out. But as a note, this was for a protocol that was using Adobe Illustrator to create lithic illustrations where it would have been challenging to collect data. If your protocol is something that collects data, then we don't recommend using this approach. And so the expected results section here is simply describing what you would expect to happen if you use the protocol and the benefits of using it. So it says, while well, a variety of methods for lithic illustration already exists with the application of our method, it's expected that users will produce publishable and user-friendly illustrations without the dependency on hand drawing experience and skill. With minimal practice and access to the graphic illustration softwares and hardwares, anyone interested, whether for personal, educational, or professional reasons can produce their own high quality illustrations. Archaeological studies are sometimes incongruous when artifact comparisons from different sites and time periods are attempted. With this protocol, one single method can be widely used when illustrating artifacts from any context or chronology. This method can therefore aid in the standardization of stone tool illustrations, offering a potential of new and invaluable comparative capabilities. So again, a simple statement about what the protocol yields and the benefits of using it for a protocol that does not produce data per se. The second approach that authors are commonly using is a proof of concept. And in this case, they are providing validation data as evidence that the protocol works. This is used for protocols that generate data and it is the most commonly used strategy. There are links here to a couple of different examples of protocols, lab protocols articles that are using this strategy. But from the first one, a couple of sentences illustrating this approach. The first is, using the protocol described, we have been obtaining large yields of high molecular weight DNA with a link to data. Um, and then some additional information using these protocols, sequencing on the Oxford Nanopore mini ion can achieve read length and 50 values of 30 to 50 kilobytes with reads exceeding 200 kilobytes and inputs ranging from 15 to 30 base pairs. 
This has been routinely achieved with various plant, fungi, animal, and bacteria samples. So again, statements about what the protocol produces, how they're using it, and then backed up by data with links to supporting figures. In our second example protocol, the authors note that the protocol provides repeatable results with stable reagents and good color stability and simple measurement techniques for use in any lab with a spectrophotometer. And it then goes on to talk a little bit more about the specific results that they achieved using this protocol. The third example or approach is to say we use data generated via this protocol to investigate a small research question. Our data show that. This is again an approach that you would use if your protocol generates data and it's used less commonly than the previously described approach. So we've provided an example here of a lab protocols article that does this, and the authors note in their expected results section, this paper describes a specialized method for purification and structural analysis of, and then more information on what they were specifically assessing. We use specifically this protocol to address the structural remodeling that undergoes the GPI glycan of a specific GPI AP during its transport to the cell surface. And then they provided data related to answering the small research question that the protocol was used to address. A reproducibility and robustness statement is also needed in your expected results section. So you want to describe what would be appropriate controls for your protocol if your protocol is something that requires controls, as well as the need for sample sizes and what sample sizes should be used and replication. And these are specifically aimed towards addressing what one would need to do to ensure that the data are robust and reproducible. So regarding controls, your data set for validating that your protocol works may be small and may not refer to or contain all of the controls that you might need. However, you should state what a larger, more reproducible study would need to have in terms of controls to achieve reproducible results. On replication, if your study is something that uses technical replicates, you want to specify what type and the number of technical replicates that would be needed. And if your method is something where a sample size description is relevant, then you want to provide an estimate, if possible, not a specific power calculation, but you're providing information about the expected variability and effect size that one might observe when using this protocol. A really important thing to remember is that in a lab protocol article, the protocol is the star of the show. So with a lab protocol article, the protocol itself is the centerpiece and the new contribution, not the data generated using the protocol. The data sets that are used to prove that the protocol works are generally small and they are only presented to show that the protocol produces what you say it produces. This contrast with a traditional research article where the results are the centerpiece and the new contribution of the study. And hence, a traditional research article will include larger data sets that are focused on a specific research question. So as a reminder, the data in your lab protocol article should not be a full research study you can write a separate paper to share all of the exciting discoveries that you made using your protocol. And when you publish that paper describing the discoveries using your protocol, you can cite your protocol in this future research publication. Okay, so when you're thinking about what expected data you might need to include, you want to provide data that will support the claims that you made about your protocol. So, for example, perhaps you claimed that whereas previous protocols yield low quality samples for a particular sample type, this protocol was yield designed to produce high quality samples from this sample type. So the evidence that you would need in your respect and results section is data to show that your protocol works with the specific sample type that you've said that it works for. And you want to use citations to support the statement that previous protocols don't work or have limitations when they're used on that sample site. So if your protocol is not about the different sample types, then you can just 
cite other work to show the limitations. You don't need data supporting those claims as well. Your data should focusing on showing that your protocol does what you says it, say it does. A note on data sharing. So PLOS One has a policy which requires that data be made openly available. Sharing data in supplements is generally not recommended because data search engines can't find data that is stored in supplemental files. Sharing data in data repositories is strongly encouraged. If you are working with human studies or samples, you want to make sure that you have ethical permission to share your data and that the data are de-identified. Regardless of what type of data that you have, you want to include a data dictionary. And in your data dictionary, you should define your variable names, what was measured, what possible values each variable can have, as well as the units. Your data set should also include metadata. This includes information on how data were collected and what one might need to know to interpret the data. In terms of choosing a repository, if there is a domain-specific repository for the type of data that you're working with, then you should use this. And you can see re3data.org for a list of different repositories. If there isn't a domain-specific repositories, then generalist repositories work well. And these are repositories like Zenodo, Dryad, or the Open Science Framework. And if you are depositing data on a repository, you want to then cite the DOI for your data in the lab protocol article. This is a brief cautionary note from the PLOS One lab protocol article instructions. Lab protocols describing routine methods or extensions or modifications of routine methods add little or no valuable to the published literature and will not be considered to publication for publication. So you want to make sure before you submit that your protocol describes a new method or a significant advance on a previous method. It is up to the editors and reviewers to assess the merits of your protocol. And if you're participating in the Publish My Protocol Working Group, um, we have no influence on that independent editorial process and no role in that independent editorial process. So we are not affiliated with PLOS One, and it's entirely up to the editors and reviewers to make those assessments about the scientific merit of your protocol. Um, results of peer review vary, as many of you already know, and reviewers can be unpredictable. So it's important to ensure that you clearly describe the benefits of your protocol compared to established methods, but also that you're honest about the limitations. And this will help others to decide whether your protocol is useful to them before they begin implementing it. A note on the publication process itself. You want to think ahead about selecting your editors. So in terms of the overall publication process, once you submit your lab protocol articles, the article first goes to a staffed editor who is specifically trained to handle lab protocol articles because this is a unique format. From there, it's then assigned to an editor with expertise in the subject area of your protocol. So when you're submitting your paper, you want to identify and suggest editors who have expertise in the subject area of your protocol and can evaluate its scientific merit. For those of you participating in the Publish My Protocol working group, if you need to talk to an editor about your specific protocol prior to submission, please let us know and we can put you in touch with someone. So homework following this video is to work on preparing your lab protocol article and also to finish refining your protocol because your protocol is ultimately the new contribution and the thing that you are publishing. So it is the star of your lab protocol article. And you're also one going to want to get feedback both on your protocol and your um, lab protocol article from your co-authors as well as others in your research group or outside who may be familiar with the protocol that you are developing and using. I'd like to thank you all for joining this video today and we hope you found it helpful and informative.